Hey everybody, it's JV, and today we're going to be talking about things I wish I knew before top surgery. Now, uh, in case you didn't know, I am a trans man who is recovering from top surgery. I'm a few weeks post-op, I'm almost to the one month mark, and yeah, I'd say my results are looking pretty dandy. Uh, let's go ahead and give you like a little update. A little, a little update. I hope YouTube doesn't like cancel me for this. Yeah, so that's the nips. Um, and yeah, so there's a lot of stuff I wish I knew about top surgery before I got it done. Um, but probably like you, I was paralyzed by the anxiety of even thinking about my chest, let alone doing any kind of research on it or like what would have to be done in order to masculinize it. Um, and so yeah, I just didn't. I found a surgeon who had decent enough photos and some repute. Uh, I knew a few people who had gone to him for breast augmentations. And yeah, I just showed up and was like, I take my money. And then I went into surgery. <laughs> um, which, yeah, not the most informed patient in that case, unfortunately. So you want to be an informed patient when you go in for your top surgery. You want to know a few things about the doctor. First and foremost, where did he study for his uh, for his surgery? You know, does he have a fellowship? Did you know where did he go to school? Um, is he a cosmetic surgeon or a plastic surgeon? This is another really important thing to know because a plastic surgeon is going to get the job done. A cosmetic surgeon is going to make it look good. Uh, at least this is what I've heard. I don't know it for a fact because I'm not a surgeon. Um, number three, what type of procedure does he think he's going to be doing for you? Now, some doctors, they only have one go-to procedure. They do it for all shapes and sizes of chest. Other doctors have a wide range of procedures, and um, sometimes they'll know immediately from your first examination exactly how they're going to do it. And sometimes they're like, look, dude, like, I might go this route, but if we get in there and it looks this way, I'm going to have to go this other direction. Um, and so that was kind of what my, my conversation with my surgeon looked like, where he's like, look, man, I could potentially just lipo this completely out and you wouldn't have to have any scars, but, and it's a big but, your cup size is vastly different between one and the other, which means that while lipo will probably work for the smaller one, the bigger one has a bigger chance of needing a different type of surgery. Now, unfortunately, I didn't ask him what the other type of surgery was, so what type of surgeon does your your uh, what type of surgery does your surgeon want to do? Um, I found out after the fact that he did a buttonhole procedure. There's a much longer, more complicated name for it that I will put down here. But he ended up doing buttonhole for both of them. Um, and in our post-op uh, appointment, the very first post-op appointment, he went ahead and told me kind of where my soreness was going to be, what I could expect in terms of recovery time. But this is all stuff you want to know ahead of time. So yeah, what can you expect in terms of recovery time? I also went into surgery assuming I was going to have drains from my top. Turns out, no drains in the top. So you want to know, am I going to have drains in the top? Now for a lot of people, the drains are really off-putting. I know for me, it took until about this week for me to be able to even handle them by myself. Um, I usually had to have somebody else come and take care of it because I could do it if it was somebody else's, but it's mine, and that's apparently a problem. Um, so yeah, are you going to have drains? If you don't want drains, is there an alternative, or do you need to find a different doctor? Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Type of procedure? Obviously the cost of the surgery, you know, that that is something they're going to tell you up front as long as you're paying out of pocket. If you're going through insurance, there's going to be some ifs, ands, or buts on, on any type of quote that you get. Um, because I paid out of pocket, I ended up paying around uh, somewhere to the tune of $25,000, $26,000 out of pocket for a top surgery and 360 liposuction. And that's the other question that you want to, to talk about with your doctor is, do they do liposuction? Do you think you're, do you want it, number one? And number two, do they think you're a candidate for it? The reason I intend, I, I chose to get liposuction is because I still had a very feminine shape in the terms of where my fat was distributed. So I went ahead and said, hey, look, I know that liposuction, the way this works is the fat cells really aren't going to come back to where you suction them away. I would like to have a more rectangular shape. I know that that's more traditionally masculine and he's more used to working on feminine people. 
Um, but yeah, he was more than happy to go ahead and take care of that. But the one question I didn't ask him, which I still don't know the answer to, is what type of liposuction are you getting? And that is a crucial, crucial question because that will determine how long your recovery time is, how long you need to wear compression garments, um, as well as the type and intensity and location of the pain that you will be feeling post-op. Another good question to ask is where are my incisions going to be? Where are my scars going to be? Um, and then the final question, which I really wish I had asked before I had the surgery, is what does the aftercare protocol look like? A lot of doctors will not give you a like that packet with all that aftercare information as well as the medications you'll be on until after your procedure. They'll give it to your caregiver, who is the person who picks you up and then is supposed to keep an eye on you for 24 hours. And then they just assume that you're going to read and remember the information on the packet. The problem is that you're also going to be on like a lot of pain meds and they're going to be some really good pain meds because the minute you start identifying and presenting as masculine, they give you the good stuff. Um, so you really want to talk about that ahead of time and I didn't do that so I ended up actually getting a minor infection in one of my incisions because turns out there was wound care that I wasn't aware of that I needed to be doing and my caregiver he read through the whole packet, he for whatever reason just did not catch that one tiny line in like size 11 point font of hey this is you need to make sure that you're cleaning these in a specific way. Um, thankfully I'm on antibiotics, like things are going well, we caught it really quick because I'm like, I really pay attention to my body, but it would have been nice to know all of this aftercare stuff ahead of time because not only would I have already had in my mind the type of routine I wanted to have on a daily basis, but I also would have had in mind exactly what I needed uh, in terms of tools and um, equipment for my recovery. So I guess on that note, um, are they going to require you to wear compression? If not, why not? Compression is incredibly important in terms of helping your skin uh, really sort of re-adhere to the surface of your chest where you've had fat removed as well as, you know, like other glands and things like that. And then on top of that, um, if they are going to have you do compression, are they providing the garment or is that something you need to get on your own? And if they're providing the garment, is it covered in the cost of your surgery or are you going to pay extra for it? I ended up paying extra for my garments. I purchased two um, and that ran me up a, t a total of about 500 extra dollars plus an aftercare kit to help with disposal of the fluid from the JP drains as well as cleansing for the different types of incisions because there's quite a few different incisions I've got on my body. Um, as a result of this m like major surgery. So all of that is stuff that you really, really, really want to ask your doctor, and I didn't ask any of that. So basically, um, what ended up happening was I had my initial consultation where, you know, he looked at my chest and he was like, yep, one of these two directions is the way we're going to go. Um, I need to think on it. Let's go ahead and process part of your payment. So I went ahead and did my down payment. Um, and I also got my kit for aftercare, which did not come with a pamphlet or a uh, packet of information about what type of aftercare I was going to need to be doing. Then I had a follow-up appointment where he walked in to me sitting in, you know, the room and was like, cool, do you have any questions for me? I was not prepared for that. I did not have any questions except for, can we move this to a sooner date? <laughs> that was it. And uh, yeah, the answer was no. And that was pretty stressful for me um, because I ended up having to go to that appointment by myself. Um, I strongly, strongly recommend not going to doctor's appointments by yourself, especially when it's something um, very, very important to you, like your surgeries. Um, it was unavoidable for me to go by myself. My partner was in a car accident, so they both ended up having to go to the ER. And it was just me. Um, that said, uh, even with as worthless as that appointment was, I did end up paying them the final amount for my surgery and also um, he did a double check on kind of body composition, uh, you know, textures and things like that of like the fat in the different areas, super weird, but that let him know what type of liposuction he was going to be doing, 
approximately how long it was going to take. All of these were things that we, he did not discuss with me. I found out later through research. Um, and of course, what type of top surgery he was going to be doing. And we talked about things like scarring. This was the time when I said, hey, I don't care about scarring, I just need this done. And he said, let's care a little bit about scarring. We want some symmetry. <laughs> and I was like, okay, symmetrical, but just fi fix it. Um, and yeah, then after that, um, I had my, like a few emails uh, that I had to fill out some electronic signatures and forms and things. And then, then it was time for surgery. They gave me my date, which was already scheduled actually, I think on the first uh, appointment. And I showed, well, uh, then they gave me some instructions for the night before, you know, special soap to wash with. Uh, specific food, uh, a type of Ensure drink, that's a pre-surgery drink that I had to drink, um, but not eat or drink anything else. Um, they prescribed me to Mazepam to take ahead of time. I did not take it because uh, anti-anxiety medication gives me anxiety, which is like, I know, it's a problem. Um, and then, uh, then I showed up to my appointment for my surgery. Uh, I had to go into the pre-op uh, like center by myself. The surgery actually took place at the same office where I had all of my appointments because it uh, it's a privately owned practice. Um, so he's got his own operating center there, which was, I needed that. That was a huge, huge uh, factor in me choosing this particular surgeon was I, based on last year's incidents in the hospital, I could not go to another hospital uh, unless I absolutely had to. So I lucked out in finding a surgeon out here who, who has his own practice. Um, and then I changed into my clothes that were going to be for the surgery. The nurse told me the surgery was going to take four hours. So I relayed that information to my partners um, and then they walked me, oh, the doctor marked me up with a marker on some, you know, he drew pictures basically. I wish I'd taken pictures of that. I think that would have been a really cool before and after type shot. But they did get some pictures, so I'm hoping to see them uh, and see kind of like the huge difference. I already feel it, I can already see it in the mirror, but having side-by-side -side photos to compare, I think will either be really good or really bad for my psyche. We'll see. Um, and then, yeah, uh, after that, they walked me over to the surgery, you know, operation room, got me on the bed. At that point, my anxiety kicked in. I was vibrating. They thought it was cold. I was like, nope, not cold, just terribly anxious. And then they gave me some, uh, some anti-anxiety medication and anti-nausea. Uh, right prior to this, they gave me um, some antibiotics and a steroid. Um, and then, uh, then I was asleep. Next thing I knew, I was waking up a million times. Like, I don't always recall the amount of times I woke up. I still don't recall every time that I woke up from this particular surgery. Apparently the first time I threw up. The second time I woke up and said, oh, I'm so glad I didn't throw up this time. And then she said, you did throw up. And I was like, well, it's a good thing I don't remember because I'm emetophobic. And then she was like, I don't know what that is. And then I explained emetophobia for like five minutes because I was too tired to have like the right words for it. So it took me like 10 years to tell her that it, it, what it is. Um, and then I was hallucinating really, really hard. I hallucinated that there was a giant rabbit worm behind me, like hovering over my bed. And I thought it was the coolest thing. And I was excited because apparently I, my brain made the connection of like, ah, oh, yes, you had top surgery. So now you get like the customary rabbit worm that you get to have as a pet. This comes from a meme that I saw on the internet where somebody combined Watership Down and Dune. So I will share that picture here because, yep, I looked at that right before my surgery and that, that stuck in my brain. Uh, and then I also had a hallucination that I was holding like a birthday cake sized scopolamine patch uh, in my hands. And I don't know if you know this, but you're not supposed to physically touch scopolamine because then if you touch your eyes, you can actually do some, some pretty uh, significant damage there. Uh, and so, yeah, don't, don't do that. But I was like, oh my god, I'm holding this scopolamine cake, and I was like, can I have this? Like, can I be holding this? And my partner and the nurse both looked at me like, what? And I was like, Scopo it's, 
am I allowed to be holding this? And they're like, you're not holding anything. And then I looked down and it was gone. That was weird. Um, you know, as a person who's had, uh, you know, visual and auditory hallucinations as a result of extreme sleep deprivation and severe migraines, um, it never, ever, ever gets old. Uh, hallucinating something and really feeling like it's there and then having somebody point out that it's not there and having your brain kind of like autocorrect. Uh, sometimes my brain will not autocorrect, but apparently coming out of operations it will, which was really cool. Uh, and then yeah, they the nurse wanted to dress me and I was like, nope, I'm already in this like compression garment and I'm feeling good enough to get to the car. It's a 40 minute drive home. Uh, I, I don't feel like waiting any longer because I know the pain meds are going to start wearing off and I'm going to get like in a lot of pain by the time we get there so I'm just going and she was like are you sure because like like you really should like maybe at least just put pants on because I didn't realize until I was like halfway out the door the compression garment that they had me wear, like right out of surgery, and I still wear it sometimes, uh, mixed in with some other compression garments that I've got, um, it has like a big hole for bathroom things, so you don't have to take it off and put it back on every time you gotta go. And yeah, that, um, so I was like halfway out the door and I was like, wait, is my ass hanging out? And the nurse was like, and my partner was like, Yep, and I was like, okay, it's fine, I look cute anyway. And I climbed into the back seat of the car, and I was gonna lay down, that was the plan, because after my hysterectomy, waking up from the surgery was really rough. And so I anticipated this would be that rough. Waking up from the surgery was not rough, aside from apparently I threw up once, but I don't remember it and I don't want to. Um, but the, the hysterectomy had it to where I, I really could only lay down, I could not move, I was in so much pain, they did not give me, uh, I think, heavy enough medication for that. Uh, but this this recovery, like coming out of this uh, surgery, I was flying high, man. I ended up, I tried to lay down in the back seat, and then I was like, no, I want to see where we're going. I want to talk to my partner, so I ended up sitting up in the back seat and like leaning forward and talking to him, and like, I was uncomfortable, but like, I was really high, so it was fine. And yeah, so, you know, I guess the final question I, I would offer you to ask your top surgeon or your liposuction surgeon is, you know, what if there are complications? What do the complications look like? And what's the plan of action? You know, if it's during surgery, what do we do? If it's, you know, while I'm home, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to just go straight to any ER? Do you want me to call you and see if you have availability at your OR? Um, all these, all these things are really important to talk about with your surgeon. Um, and, you know, so ask the questions. I guess, uh, you know, the, the real thing, too, that I, I wish that I had maybe shared with my surgeon is that I have sensory processing disorder, um, and, you know, we're working on figuring out if that's related to anything like ADHD or ASD. I don't have official diagnoses on those, but sensory processing is a very, very real thing. And it's, it's difficult to deal with. Like, it is severely uncomfortable. And so that's why I'm very, very specific about the type of fabrics that I wear, the amount of um, pressure they put on different parts of my body, and um, the type of textures that I touch or come into contact with or put in my mouth. Um, all of these are, are things that I had not really thought about as potentially being a complication uh, post-op and sort of messing with my recovery but uh, yeah no it, it absolutely has because the fabrics that are used for most compression garments are not the right kind of fabric for me so in addition to too much what I feel like is too much compression it's not too much but it feels like too much compression to where I'm feeling trapped and I'm feeling like I can't breathe um, I'm also being, like, it's not really scratched or tickled, but it's it's somewhere in between those two things by a fabric that, um, that I, is a fabric I would normally say I don't ever want to touch that. 
Um, and it's like almost a full body thing. It is like from my torso down to my knees. Um, and so yeah, that's, that's something that I wish I had talked about with the surgeon or done some research on. If you are a person who has sensory processing uh, disorder and you're going to have top surgery or liposuction, really any type of surgery that will require compression after the fact, ask if there is an alternative to either the type of surgery, the type of compression, the type of compression garment, um, or if it's like 100% necessary and if they're able to prescribe you something that will help you cope with it while you have to endure it, most surgeons for top surgery and for liposuction require you to wear a post-op garment for uh, two to four weeks, 24-7 after the fact. My surgeon wants me wearing it 24-7 uh, for four to six weeks. And yeah, after the first week, that was 100% impossible for me. And so I'm doing the best I can. This is what led me to doing more research is I looked into, okay, what happens if I don't compress 24-7 for four weeks? What happens if I stop compression at one week? What happens if I alternate types of compression garments so that the stricter ones I'm only wearing when I'm medicated heavily and asleep and then the less, less restrictive, less uncomfortable ones I'm wearing where I'm awake? What happens if I do a 12 hours on, 12 hours off thing? Um, and yeah, there is a higher risk for edema when you're not wearing your compression garment 24-7 um, for the first four weeks. Uh, it's a risk I'm willing to take because otherwise I will lose my sanity. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, you know, and those are the decisions I've made for me. If my surgeon asks, I will be honest with him, but I'm not going to outright tell him I'm disobeying your rules. Because at the end of the day, um, this surgery is happening to make me feel happy and comfortable in my body. And I can't do that if I'm dead because I didn't sleep or because I ran in front of a train. Um, because the sensory overload was literally demolishing my mind. So yeah, that's, uh, I think that's everything. Um, if you have any more questions or comments or things you want to add to the discussion, leave them in the comments below. Like, I really do want to hear from you, you know, what was your top surgery experience or what are the things you're wondering about about top surgery? I'd love to help you answer those questions, point you to some resources. Um, and, uh, if you're interested in reading anything written by me, I am uh, publishing a new book every month to my Amazon account, so you can just look up JV Lettercast. I write fiction, I write poetry, I also write some nonfiction. I'm going to go ahead and give you a link to all of that in the description below. If you feel like spoiling me so that I can do an unboxing video where I just open up a bunch of presents from you guys for the holiday season or my birthday, which is coming up, or as a celebration of the fact that I'm two months on, uh, two years on testosterone and three weeks post-op. That would be fantastic, so I'm going to go ahead and leave an Amazon wishlist link in the description. And uh, yeah, uh, if you like what you saw today and you want to see more, hit that button down below, subscribe, become a member of the Dracula Tribe and earn your antlers, and don't forget to follow me on all these social media platforms. Um, and remember, you are wonderful, drink some water, even though it's cold you need to keep hydrated, um, and turn off, you know, turn off your electronics for a little while. Go out into nature or listen to, you know, an audiobook or, or read a book, you know, by the fire. I, I guess an audiobook would require some electronicness, but, uh, yeah, turn off your screens. It's hurting your eyes. I love you. Bye. Hey, everybody. It's JB, and today... My tripod is, like, crooked or something. This is very strange. It's a little bit better. Am I crooked now? Hey, everybody. It's JB. Let's try that again. Three, two, one.